मॉर्निंग राजी हाय बॉबी हाय युको हाय मॉर्निंग युको आप हाय यू गुड हाउ आर यू ऑल गुड ऑल गुड या तक या शुड वी स्टार्ट या इट्स इट्स माय सिंपल मी ऑफ द रेस स्पेशल फॉर टुडे गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन इट्स एन ऑनर टू हैव यू हियर ऑन द 18th सेशन which is the final lecture of isola one by one rajasthan and gujarat chapter in this series the title is called beyond boundaries <laughs> few like minded people from both chapters during these tough times looked at the opportunity to touch more people or rather more hearts and explain more about landscape profession uh clearly to explain to the people what landscape is all about clear some preconceived notions about the profession explain the diversity of our profession the researches which can be pursued the complexity of the profession and most importantly to celebrate with the designers the joy of executed projects my and and in this guys learn from all it was deliberate attempt to invite young professionals and give them the platform they truly deserve it was not difficult but it was not easy from talking to many speakers across to arranging trials to understanding systems of how to address people on such large platforms which we landscape architects are not so used to working from remote sites back of beyond and reshuffling lectures based on availability of people and plenty more but we loved it we loved it all the way the journey began on 18th april 2020 we had the pleasure of speakers from aurangabad bangalore bhuvaneshwar hyderabad kolkata pune jaipur mumbai sangli in all to hear 17 professionals and to say their commitment towards landscape profession was incredible however the there was only one precondition on this platform uh, to invite them you have been active isola member isola is expanding and we need more and more and more landscape architects students from approved colleges studying landscape past members whose memberships have expired or to renew or update or anything that is to to make this a society a society which is seen and appreciated by all and people are often asking what will we get out of this and our answer as a chapter both the chapters collective was 30 minutes of international air time <laughs> which is more than what you could ever dream from a society platform and that's the least we could have offered rest we all understand and appreciate the value of certain things as soon as we started speaking and you know very often these lectures would end the idea would be that people would very quickly you know you could see the decline in the number of people as soon as the lectures would get over and once the speaker has said bye bye and we have said a thank you after as soon as at 7:50 7:58 in the evening everyone would go back people would go back and our group would just send a message saying who's next <laughs> so that was the way we actually motivated ourselves today it's a great pleasure to be celebrating this day with two people uh yuko and raji i would have i'm taking the liberty of taking their first names uh so let me just quickly introduce yuko uh, who is from japan yuko if you could just say a good hello to everyone hi <laughs> and raji who is from singapore or should i say pune singapore or i should say <laughs> i don't know what but yeah so i think that's Doesn't the matter. way it is what yeah hi everybody do, uh, hi everybody good morning and what we will now do is we will uh, request yuko to first take on the stage and then we will connect raji later so uh, raji i'll connect back with you in some time yeah 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 okay uh, a brief introduction about yuko correct me if i'm wrong konnichiwa oh, yes konnichiwa abhi thank you uh, <laughs> Yuko Nagamori is a landscape designer and owns the firm Tabby Cat Landscape based in <laughs> Kumamoto, Japan. Yes. She has a BSc honors in landscape and garden design from Ritual University UK. 
her planting oriented landscapes design promotes new perennial movement encouraging the use of indigenous planting species in her projects she is vastly experienced with project commissions across continents i would say europe north america southeast asia asia pacific currently that's okay yoko that's okay uh, currently she is involved <laughs> currently Please. current yeah my my cat is meowing no no yes yes she's supposed to be sleeping at this time of day please <laughs> sorry, sorry please continue yes sorry. no no please 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 uh she has been actively involved in creating many of the finest gardens in the best garden shows of the world like chelsea flower show the bloom and singapore garden and flower show she has also been involved in planning managing and coordinating internationally acclaimed garden shows in japan she has been actively involved locally promoting the landscaper and young designers to showcase their skills to various mediums which will eventually help japanese landscape industry she has also been seen a frequent visitor to india as she participated in inkal 2013 in ahmedabad and isola national conference kochi 2019 Yoko, I would now request you to share your screen and please share your journey with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Bobby, for your wonderful, wonderful introduction and hello to all. Uh, my name is Yuko Tanabe, and it's been a pleasure to be a part of this uh, great, great opportunity to present my works, and I hope you will enjoy it. So let's start. Uh, okay, I. Can you share screen? Okay. Can I? Oh dear. What? Um. Uh, sorry. Share screen. Yes. trouble i'm doing sharing screen okay i gonna share yes and bring my powerpoint to the full is this working right um uh, i hope it's working it's working perfectly okay good so let's start uh Yes. Uh, can you can you stop mewing? No, no. Um, hi. So let's start. I'm I'm so sorry for a little little thinking, but uh, okay. Uh, this is my presentation page. One start with my three years old naturalistic planting for my client, and it's a very very. Uh, in small budget but yes that's what what is supposed to be it's the minimum impact to the environment and financially the minimum so um uh, i heard the theme of this talk it's a beyond boundary and my journey is not a straight line and i i crossed the boundary in many places many times and many ways so i thought sharing my experience will suit the today's theme so the my history and the background is i am a woman in japan and plus countryside and the 
for the uh, World Gender Index, um, indicating equality between men and women, is showing that Japan is uh, 121st country in 153 countries. So, which is very, very low and um, it's below India. I think India is, you know, on a, on a higher level than us. So it's a bit challenge to be a woman and the health and the educational sector is pretty much equal. But when it comes to business and the politics, the woman is still kind of second citizen and uh, it's a very challenging situation. And living on the countryside, that means I will ne I've been never involved in a large project like the mega one, like uh, Tokyo Olympic Games related, and always close to the nature and uh, have to pick any work comes in front of me. I, I have, I cannot be picky on the uh, business. So even though I was trained and worked abroad as a landscape designer, I hardly get any simple and straight work as a landscape designer. It's always a little bit of a twist and can you do, it's not your thing, but can you, can you just be on the side way and do what you can do and it's winding. But as I said, I am a garden designer trained and a show garden gardener. So what's the difference between the plain gardeners and the show garden gardener is the show garden is a special, um, very different uh, garden, way of gardening. It's a garden in a limited time and plant planting beautifully to win the gold medal in the, in the contest and in a competitive uh, situation. And uh, there are a few or many uh, international garden show, which is the Chelsea flower show at the top and uh, then a lot of you know, many scale and size, they are international garden shows. So I've been uh, traveling around to help my fellow garden designers jobs and um, try to help them to get the gold medal and the head gardeners and the show manager is a uh, very, it's a big female garden in, in my island. It's a west side of Japan called House Tempoche. So uh, although I am a trained garden designer, but um, uh, using my experience to being a show garden gardener and um, plant you know, planting experience, I was asked to, to manage the theme garden and uh, and organizing the flower flower event and the garden show locally and the lecture yes i used to teach in part time and that's a wonderful opportunity to meet the younger and the talented people and yes that's sort of part of inspiration to me too to meeting lovely young people and um, trying to bridge you know, them to the next step or encouraging and open the door for them. And the cultural landscape is another passion. And living in the countryside, I have, yes, keen interest on the cultural landscape again uh, as well. And my current project with, uh, with other university in Japan is uh, making digital archive of traditional village of Bhutan and we presented the paper about our latest research in the Isola last year in Cochin. So I might have met you there last year. So this is uh, Beth Chato, my mentor and I'm 
unfortunately, she passed away uh, two years to no last, not last year, maybe last. No, no, two years ago, and at the age of 94. And this, um, this picture has been taken three days before her passing. And I can still believe it, I can't. But she is a great, um, very, very uh, influential lady of this kind of naturalistic planting. So this is a famous, her garden called gravel garden and okay the perennial movement the first one has been occurred in 100 years ago and there is a lady called Gertrude Jacob and she uh, transformed or she sort of introduced uh, perennial planting for mainly labor labor cost cut and labor labor cut so instead of, oh, I, instead of um, planting annual plants many times a year, um, that lady introduced the perennial. So just once you plant it, the plants come back year after year. But uh, still, she is, she is following a strong color scheme to sort of paint the landscape by flower color or leaves color and controlling the, the, the color palette. And when it comes to Beth Chattles, her principal is one step further. Um, this one particularly, she never irrigate and never feed and learn and observe the plants well and put the plants where it suits. So these are mainly Mediterranean or dry and sunny place loving plants all over the world. So they don't really need uh, so frequent irrigation and things like that. And then let the nature take its take space. And the color, no, she has no control on color. When the plants are happy together, then what produce plant is in the color, form and texture, everything is in harmony. So that's her philosophy. And um, this is still at my, at my base and a strong background. But 10 years later or the early 21st century, there is a Dutch person um, who's still present here. It's brought her things the one step farther so i will go back to him later his name is peter Woodall, and um, what's different from his work and her work is the beth is still mixing evergreen and succulent plants and evergreen shrubs to create the structure and the backbone to the to the ground and uh, she needs she wants to see something during the winter and um, where while peat, he doesn't mind to cut them all back and empty the ground completely and start the new season from the scratch all over again. So, so in this garden, oh sorry, in this garden you will see still something in winter. And that's a show garden gardener. And I am planting a, a show garden for Joel Thompson in Chelsea. And uh, this is big Angelique. Angelique. And it's a, a little bit leggy and small. So I will put um, next plant together and make it, make it look bigger and nicer stock. And the pressure and um, limitation is nothing to compare with a general gardening. We, we are given like a 10 days or one week to plant and we need it to make it work, make it pretty in the plants we got on site and we selected a plant, the not sort of good enough one to the reject shelf and other sort of good plants to other side and um, then 
uh, quickly making decision what next, what to plant next, what to plant next, and what plant and what plant can be next to each other and sharing the same conditions and looking great and what the judges appreciate or with avoiding being marked down or all, the, you know, all sort of thing um, going on the head. And most of all, so what's the designer intending to present and create? So um, it's a planting job, but also you need to be mind leader and interpret what, what sort of picture is in designer's head and um, do it. So this is the, uh, this one is look like this and you see the next to the sculpture, the, the left hand, there is a lovely big angelic plant, but that's what I put sort of few plants together to make a bush. And this is how it looks like very naturally and beautifully um, blending to the, uh, to make a, a nice garden. And of course the Joe herself, it's a brilliant, brilliant plant lady. So she set up herself where sort of kind of roads or you know get important colored, but all the filling plants or background plants, it's all um all sort of passed on to us, the planting ladies or god show garden gardeners. And we always work in a group of same lady show garden gardeners and all over the world. One is come from New Zealand and the other it's Japan and et cetera, et cetera. And this is show managing business back in Japan. This is it's a garden show called Gardening World Cup where I organized in a theme park called House Tim Bosch. And uh, I, I'm in the uniform of the theme park and entertaining the visitors and make doing the guide tour and uh, this is the uh yeah sort of a miniature chelsea flower show it wanted to be but more opportunity to local gardener and contractor to brush up their uh, skill and the pre opportunity to present their work and this is the call the application forms uh, front page and that shows many many faces from the from all over the world. The one, the Incheon Lin from Malaysia, and Leon Kluge from South Africa, you know, the guy from Morocco, James from France, Italy, Singapore, Netherlands, Japan, etc., etc. So my job is to choose the designers and work and matching contracted each garden and controlling the budget and ask the judges to come over and do the make up the timetable and the programmers, all sort of thing. So this is the proposal for the sponsor, uh, how they um, explaining how this year's show is going to be like. So this is a little bit, uh, these are irregular shaped, but it's all 100 square meters plot. And that's the outline of the palace buildings, and it's it's fun shaped. So uh, I that's a 2016. So it's going to be hmm, 2017, I think. So we planned to have eight show gardens and smaller show balcony gardens and things like that and little shops. So. I show you uh, some of the works we've done in the garden show. That's the uh, exhibition of Peter Woodolf in the foreground, and the background is, I think, it's an uh, Injun Ling's one of his his works. I think he presented three or four times. Yes, uh, this is an uh, Islamic garden by Injun Lim of Malaysia. It's amazing. It's always, yeah, I think that his work, this one is 2012, but we used this image for the advertisement and the pub, yeah, 
uh, pub publicity for many, many times. And this is another my favorite. Um, it's designed by Adam Frost of England. He used all Japanese material and made a naturalistic and rustic English country garden. But it's perfectly look Japanese as well as it could be in England in the northern part near the Scotland border in the kind of feeling and it is so look natural. The key is he brought all these rocks and gravels and even kind of small, small things between paving from one quarry. No mix, no, absolutely no mix of different materials from one quarry. And this is a lady called Pui from Thailand. And her work is highly graphic and symbolistic. So the blue flower represents the sea and the yellow flower is a kind of good luck color and the royal color for Thai people. And that's uh, on water, on, on the boat, the market or some kind of cultural um, ex things in Bangkok to be on the ground. And uh, she made a um, very modern but abstract form. So I think, yeah, this one won the best in show in 2017, was it? Yeah, I think so. So this is my head gardener job. Yeah, um, sometime I wear these you know, things, you know, funny things to entertain uh, the guest. And this is the house in Bosch and it looks like a real Dutch, uh, Dutch palace. But actually there is a sort of a real, real scale a replica of the real Dutch palace called House de Bosch. I think it's supposed to be a summer house of the royal family and exist. And this is the Tulip Festival there. Uh, we invited a Dutch garden designer called Jacqueline van der Kloot to design the garden and look at the tulips. It's, it's not just a strong red to the orange or apricot. It's making sort of detailed grad, grad, gradation from dark dots to the a little bit apricot and it's that's like a Gustav Klimt work. It's very, very clever. And you see really black tulips in between. That gives like a velvet like effect in a red or dark pink color. And there are some lighter pink coming through the sea of red tulips. It's really, really clever. And um, yeah. And my job is make this theme park, House Stenbosch, the world class flower resort. So anytime the uh, visitor come, there is something to see. So the garden festival is in October and autumn contents. This is a winter from two, uh, February to April for running two months. And this is how we planted the thing. And uh, I was in charge of importing all the tulips, frozen tulip bulbs from Netherlands and the quantity and the logistics and purchase and organizing uh, those people to work. So that's, hmm, uh, I am responsible, I was responsible for it. And this is another image from the another place in the tulip festival and the flowering with lovely daffodils. And that's a cottage, the accommodation. And another picture. So, so the FEMA park is very, very Dutch, the Netherlands. So you can travel, you know, uh, Netherlands without 12 hours flight. That's the idea, I think. But what Netherlands doesn't have is the mountain and a little disappointing Japanese building at the background.
but otherwise it looks really really Netherlands and yeah there are real Dutch people working there and Dutch visitors as well and they say wow <laughs> because I think the place when it's built it's a Japanese booming economy and they imported the even one brick and one roof tile, everything from Netherlands. And uh, this is the image of the Rose Festival in May. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit naughty. Uh, I picked this from a website. And in May, I am always in England to do the Chelsea Flower Show. So even I was sort of planning and uh, doing uh, the plan, the publicity for the Rose Festival, I hardly never seen the real Rose Festival in the park. So that's the tower. And this is a Lily Festival. Again, in the area in the spring, we had a tulip, but now it's completely planted and in different plants, which is Lily. So this is very, very expensive thing to do and uh, it's not a natural planting at all. So I would say, excuse me, but it's a stupid planting, but this is a very uh, commercially easy thing for the publicity, because if we do the naturalistic planting, then you can't say what flower, how many, in what color is, it's there and this planting it's so monotonous and do and expensive but we can sort of put the publicity like 10,000 tulip uh, lilies it's flowering in the house in Bosch or the rose festival saying one million roses waiting for you so come on visit us so it's quite catchy but ah uh, it's not ethical or economical or in what way i don't really agree it so this is the um my background explaining where i born and trained and even though i wish to be a full-time garden designer straight line i am sort of planting around in the garden show and then being a park manager and organizing the Japanese garden shows and flower festivals for a bit. And in the meantime, I sometimes do the cultural landscape study project and teach in the junior college. So that's, that's a long introduction of myself. So the part two is then what's the naturalistic planting? So and its application to the public space, local, and in warmer climate. So the uh, naturalistic planting, it's basically very popular in Europe and North America, and um, basically Western countries where the, the uh, climate is cooler. But I brought the essence of the idea to the Kyushu Island, which is warmer and uh, warmer and uh, global warmization. Now we became like a semi-tropic, but this is how far we could stretch. Um, before, yes, this is the definition, the naturalistic planting. I'm not sure whether you can read this all, but it's, it is uh, called the New Perennial Movement or Dutch Movement. And um, using the herbaceous, herbaceous plants, where uh, my mentor, Beth Chato, mixed with the shrubs and the trees, but the new, new perennial movement, it's all about the deciduous uh, planting. So the, the idea is it's spring, it's a bare ground and new fresh growth coming through. So the spring is a celebration of fresh greens, few flowers. And then summer is a profusion of color and autumn is slightly 
yellowed the colored leaves and tufts of grass and grass and winter is for sort of frosted dead plants but how they catch the move, movement the wind and the light and creating a nice atmosphere that matters and appreciate the plants through the life cycle at any stage it's it's a quite opposite approach to the uh, manicured planting which i've been repeatedly doing in the theme park it's just enjoy the color of the plants and when the flower finished goodbye and then plant a new plant again but this one is so in the spring then cut them all back and start from the scratch so it's all right if we had a typhoon or flooding on plant it's looking sort of poor by the end of the year the next year we will start all fresh so reset and um, that's that's um that brings to less uh, environmental impact and cost wise it's a low man, lower maintenance, low cost, and sustainable in comparison to manicured annual bedding. So this is what I done for the car park in a public space in Kumamoto. This is a video. Have a look. So. It's the empty plot. Then start from the dark bottles. And tulip started. It is, I think, March, and this is April. The purple alien started, and all after the tulip, many herbaceous plants started flowering. He's of Echinacea angelica and lily. This is indigenous plants in Kumamoto and Padrania. It's another indigenous plant. As hibiscus, this is a popular plant in warmer climate. And eupatrim and hydrangea, again echinacea and vernonia. And we planted all the plants in the beginning of the season. Nothing is being added. And then that's last week in the end of July and August. So the car park looking much better and created much joyful place for the public. And it's a pleasure to see people stop and taking a picture of those lovely plants. So I introduced the perennial in the first half of the year. And if you want to see what's going to be in autumn and winter, this is the best movie to watch. It's called Five Seasons and uh, the Gardens of Pete Woodhoff. And this Dutch gentleman, it's the top man. He's playing the top of the game of the naturalistic planting. And he's one of the person who started the new perennial movement. So the, for the rest of the season, I strongly recommend to watch this movie. And this is Mr. Woodolf's private garden in Umelo, in Netherlands, and exactly the same spot. Um, if you could see the castle, this hedge is there. Oh, sorry. So it's exactly the same place in July and February. In the July, it's a color, and in winter, it's like milk tea or brown. The, the plants die down in a sort of different, different color in the sepia, sepia world. But, but the idea is, it's, it's a nature. So they enjoy this you know, part of this time of the year as well leave it all it's you no know, don't don't sort of get angry to see it's oh blah 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 it's ugly or blah blah blah, blah, blah. it's not that's the that's uh, part of the appreciation of the season 
あの、in early February or mid February, it's cut all them down. And then next year, the fresh green, it started growing through. So,、uh, my point is, this is the, again back to the house then bosch, and this is the windmill and the garden park. Planting, manicured planting, same place. So, this roof and this, that roof and that one is the same, sorry,、uh, the same place. You have、uh, annual bedding here and then replanted by sunflower. And this is the extreme one because we run the tulip festival for two weeks. These poor but hardworking people. It's replanting the tulip every two weeks for four times during the tulip festival. And once you plant it, then another one or second and third one is waiting in the background nursery. So、uh, pull them off and plant new one, and they, they're stuck. Tulip plant is、uh, strictly temperature managed and controlled environment and, and、uh, waiting to be planted and pulled off. It's a very, very expensive process. And then I, this is,、uh, I hope you can read some text, but that's the simple financial.、Uh, The cost comparison. The green line is a perennial and the black line is annual plants. So the initial is the perennial plants is tend to be more expensive than the annual bedding plants. But because they are putting many plants, many plants in one place, maybe four times a year. So the total sum of the number accumulates and making rapid growth on the graph. And while the、uh, perennial planting is it's starting expensive, but it's the replace the changing, the switching the amount, you know, even before one year and goes up at gentle, gentle rates. And、um, then the, the labor cost is also, if you repeat, The same place, planting and discharging, planting, discharging the plants four times a year, it will sort of accumulate like this. But for perennial, yeah, it's more or less the same when you plant it. It's,、uh, it's in relation to the number of the plants you put on the ground. But every year, you are not planting the same plant again. Maybe adding 30% of plants. Some plants, it's not happy and die down, or you may find new plants to try. So maybe sort of one third or maybe 30% of the total number, you might want to add it on. And then you need a labor to do the planting job. But again, this is going, you know, building up much slower. And This work, the planting annual bedding plants over and over, is very repetitive and you only need unskilled laborers and suitable for keeping employment because their motive is money. So, more work, more spending hours, more money that's their business. Then, the plant knowledge you don't really need because. You're, it's actually growing, it's actually not growing the plants. You know, the placing flowering already flowered pl plants and waiting them to die and then pull it off and they bring more flowers already flowering in the green tunnel. But this is, you are actually growing the plants on the ground. So it's sustainable. It's, it's suitable to employ one or two, the few number of experienced gardeners who know s how to grow 
the plant and knowledgeable person and a small number. So that's the difference between making nat and continuing naturalistic planting and using unskilled labors and spending much, much money on the ground. So um, this is the uh, climate comparison. So the, my place is more or less uh, similar to the Indian, the Northern Indian area, generally, generally. Oops, sorry. So I hope the video I showed you and the slides, uh, upcoming slides, the principle may be, may be applicable in India as well. And um, Indian, Indian sort of temperate area tend to have a drier winter, but that could overcome by irrigation. So the work culture in Japan is these simple uh, unskilled labors, they are good what they are told to do so, but the motive is money than the creating a landscape or planting area in a sort of ethical way, ethical method, or making it, make it better or making change, it's not, not to them. And um, it's hard to tell or motivate them to end the result is beautiful or better. The only the matter is if their sort of life is, you know, all right on the safe boat, they are happy. So the the more work when the wage is it's welcomed. And while the naturalistic planting is sometimes need to sort of taught by the master who got a tremendous knowledge. And unfortunately, we can't share that such great knowledge to all of them, many people. So changing um, traditional unskilled labors and uh, you can't sort of make them to create the naturalistic planting in the next year or in two years, so all of a sudden, there is no magic to do that. And how complicated and how div tricky can be is this, it's the plant inside, actually. Uh, if you love the plants, know the plants, this is exciting. But if you don't know and just doing the planting and killing the plants and planting plants for work, to get paid, this is a nightmare. So you need educated and experienced gardener to lead the project. And you, and, and this is how it laid out. You put the grit on the string and spray it on the ground. And that's alphabet is what the plant's name. So the what plant name maybe could ast astilbe, echinacea, babina, you know, that's a steeper to be sort of on the ground. But you need you need the plant name at least. So this is myself on, on his planting plant in hand and putting a spray on it. So the, my plan is to be the bridge between knowledgeable gardeners and unskilled laborers, how they can sort of work together and appreciating both parties' strength and what they can do and supporting each other. So they make the system. So this is how I came up in my local town. We called it Yurutuna Gardeners. The Yuruto is in our local dialect. It's called the chill out and the relaxed gardeners. And um, he is the head of the contractor and businessman. And I am the designer and gardener. 
And she is the important person, the bridge, team one and two. I explain to you later. And he is a government officer who wants to cut down the cost because this public space planting is using our local tax. And uh, the lower money is better and cost effective. And uh, But he wants to have a beautiful garden to look at too as well. So cutting the budget, but having a more beautiful planting. So his main task is make a contract and pay to the contractors. Yes, he controls the money and the authorizing and getting the permissions and gather sponsors. Yeah, and char charities and volunteers, he just call. And um, my task is consulting to the officer and organizing the team and ideas and selecting plants and drawing up planting plants. And the team one, it's a professional contractors. They are paid gardeners and undertaking regular and plain repetitive, but essential tasks like watering, weeding in the contract, on the paper, and work in weekdays, of course, because it's their business. So they work in weekdays. So there is a minimum thing they learn so, which is what's the plants and what's the weed. But other than that, the weeding and the watering is the thing they are doing for ages, ages. So they should be good at that. And they, are, they don't have to be scared by you know, seeing many new plants and a new thing. And the volunteers, team two, it's a non pet It's a perfectly, completely um, unpaid the volunteers, but they are keen gardeners. They have been traveled, they have been watched movies, they have been sort of looking through the coffee table magazines and the books and like that, and they know how the perennial planting looks like, and they want to have a garden, but they are living in a flat or, or you know, their life without gardening, but the com kind of com community gardening opportunity is not great in my in my city so so there is an opportunity so they do dead heading and supporting plants and making labels and taking pictures and put, uploading sns all the touching work things and then having a tea and the sweet so basically they are having fun and this lady is her day job is a contractor but she she also joins volunteers. So they sort of she's bridging those two um, things and um, two teams and sharing knowledge and information. And the volunteers have a, a all sort of different day job like bankers, teachers, engineers, and I'm doing, you know, I'm not full time uh, gardener. So I'm doing my thing as well. So this is the table to summarize the points. Uh, by the way, the volunteers are insured. So this is the site before. It's so horrible. It's there's like a dying, in dying pansy planted in line. You see the cars. And then now the the planting area looking. Yeah, happy with the sort of bigger plants and they plant it there and grow and help themselves to reach this height and color and yeah, looking happy. And apart from weeding them, yeah, it's our garden. It's, it's a planting bed, but the right one is a garden. So this is uh, quickly showing I'm doing my job. I can draw drawings. And I chose the uh, plants for the reasons, for the schemes. And this is the enlarge of the, one of the planting plant. And now it's working. So team one, the professional contractors. And team two is the 
volunteer in a short time of period. We try to make it looks like it's been there for 100 years. And this is how we work. That's me working, the real bird's nest. And another guy from Japan is um, making nursery grown trees looking like a wild. And yeah, uh, this is part of my work. It looks like self seeded weed. So I split the plants into pieces, but not to die, and then plant it here to there and scatter around. And by the way, the Chelsea Flower Show is prohibited to take plants from wild. So everything needs to be grown in the nursery. And James Basson, he asked the nursery to grow uh, poor looking sort of conditions and conditioned plants beforehand or year before to make the effect and the realistic. And this is the most complicated thing I've ever done is uh, this part. So the, all, the, all this nursery grown weedy plant is even split it into a small plant and uh, put it in and put some sand and the mist and take it off and put some moss and step back and check. And if it looks a little, a little bit of artificial, then let's do it again until it look really, really natural. And uh, yes, uh, the visitors and amateur gardeners won't appreciate, I know, I know comparing with the Joe Thompson's beautiful flower and colorful garden, but it is it's technically technically very hard to do so and the judge it knows again so the when we are planted it's a construction site so we are starting from the bare ground in and you know, achieving it in a short time of period so this is much easier i know the amateur gardeners and the people coming for flower show to see the flower will be much happier to see the planting like this, but this is easier. And to win the gold and to make a higher score, you need to challenge um, more difficult and complicated things like this. Yeah. Yes. So, it's a competition and the criteria is getting a little bit funny, maybe, but the, yeah, I wanted to, sh I wanted to, sh you know, sh let's say, yeah, it's easier. So quickly, another tip. So this is a lovely garden, very natural looking. And again, looks like it's been there for years and years, but the trick is, it's put the taller plants into the pot and leave in some gaps and place a flowering meadow turf. It's like a carpet and the seeded flower is already small, you know, planted and split the carpet, the, the turf, and then put them in between the potted plants and that's the end, plant, the end result. And it's looking gorgeous. So that's the uh, how it how to achieve the instant naturalistic looking garden for the Chelsea Flower Show with a lot of lot of budget and many many skilled gardeners. You no, know, you can ever wish for. And to close this my presentation. Uh, this is the uh, last image taken only yesterday and uh, take you back to the reality. This is a picture of the nature reserve in Kumamoto. Um, it's it's an, uh, one hour drive from my home, roughly. And uh, I think nature does a beautiful job and always a source of great inspiration for sustainable but visually beautiful planting. And um, yeah, um, 
I loved it. And I hope I, you will enjoy the lot of uh, new things and planting and techniques or making teams or something you might want to try. Try something in something in India. Some some of the idea might work with you in India. I hope so. So thank you very much for your time. Bye bye. Thank you, Yuko. <laughs> you can have a sip of your tea. I think you must be very very tired. <laughs> <laughs> but wonderful. Uh, we'll get back to you with the question and answer series. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I would request Mr. Mahendra Singh Rathor from Summon Irrigation to join in. Mahendra Singh, good morning, Hello. good afternoon. How are you? Hello. Yeah, very good afternoon, sir. How are you? Oh, very, very good. Uh, Mr. Mahendra Singh Ji had some internet issues because of the heavy rains in Jaipur yesterday. So he got kind of got, got in slightly late. Uh, let me give yeah. you a small introduction about Mahendra Singh Ji Rathor from Sun Irrigation. Uh, he is a well-renowned and well-reputed irrigation consultancy and executing firm for more than two and a half decades. Uh, surprisingly, I'm very, very happy and very touched to know that he has been tweaking his videos every time for the last five weeks towards gearing towards landscape profession, which is very, very interesting, rather than just showcasing what are the kind of stuff available in the market. Today, he will be presenting a brief video on smart and digital irrigation technology and systems for the wide range of landscape projects. एक सेकेंड ना हिमांशु हम लोग वापस करते हैं
महेंद्र सिंह जी हेलो महेंद्र सिंह जी हेलो यस सर कैन यू आप सुन सकते एक्चुअली हिमांशु इज प्लेइंग या या बट एक्चुअली हिमांशु इज प्लेइंग दिस नो नो देयर इज सम ऑडियो ग्लिच इसलिए हम उसको रेक्टिफाई कर रहे हैं या ओके आई थिंक हमको स्मार्ट और डिजिटल इरिगेशन से ज्यादा स्मार्ट और डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजी भी सीखना पड़ेगा वीडियो का वी आर आल्सो लर्निंग एंड दिस इज व्हाट वी कॉल्ड बियॉन्ड कंट्रोल्स एक्चुअली हिमांशु इज डूइंग इट एट हिज एंड आई थिंक या या आई आई एम आल्सो कनेक्टेड विद हिम ही इज टेलिंग मी दैट सेम थिंग इन द मीन टाइम महेंद्र भाई आपसे मुझे एक सवाल पूछना था राइट right. क्या मैं पूछ सकता हूं आपको एक बिल्कुल बिल्कुल आप आप इतने सालों से कर रहे हैं एंड नाउ दैट यू आर बीइंग पार्ट ऑफ दिस इसोला फॉर द लास्ट अबाउट अ मंथ एंड अ हाफ व्हाट इज योर एक्सपीरियंस अबाउट सीइंग न्यू वर्क अबाउट लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्ट्स नहीं एक्चुअली लास्ट मोर देन टू एंड हाफ डेकेड से जो मैं काम कर रहा हूं उसमें डिफरेंट लोकेशंस पे डिफरेंट आर्किटेक्ट्स के साथ में काम करते हुए जो एक्सपीरियंस अभी तक हुआ है या उनके mm-hmm. काम करने के साथ में जो सीखने को मिला है जी एक्चुअली पहले के अभी के कंपैरिजन में क्या है कि जो इम्पोर्टेंस एक लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्ट को पहले मिलता था उसके बजाय आज की तारीख में क्लाइंट ज्यादा इम्पोर्टेंस उसको देने लगा है उसका वैल्यू क्या है वो एक्चुअली समझने लगा है बिल्कुल क्योंकि एक्चुअली पहले क्या होता था कि कोई एक साइट है सपोज राजस्थान के कोई डेजर्ट में एक साइट है या आपके पूना या नासिक में जहाँ पे हिल्स भी है रिवर्स में है तो एक लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्ट उसको इकोलॉजिकल वैल्यू के साथ में क्या इम्पोर्टेंस हो सकता है वो ज्यादा बेटर समझ सकता है ये चीज जो है अब यानी क्लाइंट एक्चुअली समझने लगा है कि यदि वो किसी लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्ट को पे कर रहा है तो उसका कुछ वैल्यू है उसकी कुछ वर्थ है उसमें बराबर है बहुत बढ़िया और आई थिंक जो 17 जो आपके सेशन रहे हैं वन टू वन सेशन के उसमें आपके रंग जितने भी यंग लैंडस्केप आर्किटेक्ट है उनके जो डिफरेंट प्रोजेक्ट देखे हैं ठीक है वो रियली यानी बहुत ही यानी फैसिनेटिंग लगे हैं बहुत यानी डेडिकेटेड लगे हैं अपने काम पे ठीक है तो उन सबको आपके आप जैसे सीनियर का ब्लेसिंग इज ऑलवेज वेलकम और हम भी आपके साथ बहुत सीखे हैं सर महेंद्र सिंह जी आई थिंक द वीडियो इज रेडी टू प्ले तपन इफ यू कैन स्टार्ट द वीडियो सॉरी महेंद्र सिंह जी हमारी तरफ से एंड वॉम ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम सन इरिगेशन इन द लास्ट ट्वेंटी सेवन ईयर्स विद हंड्रेड ऑफ सक्सेसफुल इरीगेशन प्रोजेक्ट एंड विद ट्रस्ट ऑफ आर वेल्यूएबल क्लाइंट्स Sun Irrigation has established itself as a renowned and well-reputed irrigation consultancy and executive firm in the field of irrigation. Our work starts with surveying and designing. While designing systems, we consider factors such as soil type, water requirement of plants and shrubs. We design irrigation systems in a way to provide optimum, frequent and uniform supply of water to each plant. 
and we put the right products at the right place. While designing an irrigation system, first we consider the habitat and species of plants and their water requirements. Like we can't give an equal quantity of water to xerophytes and palm. Proper irrigation and fertigation is very important for every healthy plant, be it agriculture or horticulture or landscape. So as per the requirement, we plan what sort of irrigation product is required and we calculate the total requirement of water on site. Apart from designing, proper installation is also very important and for that, we have a team of well-trained and experienced technicians. In today's digital world, people want smartphones, students want smart classes, citizens want smart cities. So why should we not go for smart irrigation? It's the demand and requirement of time to adopt smart irrigation solutions. Earlier people used flood irrigation to irrigate plants or turfs, which caused a lot of wastage of water. Then people adopted manual operated drip and sprinkler irrigation systems, wherein people saved 40 to 50% of water. In the early days of smart irrigation, people started to install automation controllers which were operating the systems on a preset programmed schedule and timers. But now, smart irrigation controllers monitor weather, soil conditions, evaporation and plant water use to automatically adjust the watering schedule to actual conditions of the site. It is a Wi-Fi enabled controller where you can monitor your landscape through a mobile app. So it doesn't matter that you are at home or away from the landscape area. Just turn on the automatic seasonal adjust. It will work as per the climate, local weather, temperature, humidity and soil moisture, which will result in significant water saving. Similarly, we have NetBeat, a first irrigation system with a brain. It is a Netafim product, which is a Israeli company. NetBeat is the first system to integrate monitoring, analyzing and controlling the entire irrigation system. It's a digital revolution in irrigation and fertigation. The NetBeat main control unit gets field data from field sensors through remote terminal unit and weather data from satellite and after cloud-based analysis, main control unit gives signal to remote terminal units to operate the irrigation system accordingly, which is resulting more yield, uniform growth of plants, low cost, reduced weather risks and simple management. So we must be smart enough for smart use of water with smart irrigation solutions. Using good quality products from the top irrigation manufacturers is our USP. So we use equipments from US based companies like Rainbird, Hunter, Toro and Israeli companies like Netafim, Burmed and Amiad. Our mission is to provide the best irrigation solution to our customers for an intelligent use of water. Thanks. Thank you, Mahindra Singh Ji. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you please stay with us. We will get back to you with more question and answer series once we have sure. one more guest from us. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure of calling in Miss Radhakshmi Ayer. Sorry, I'm I think you're on. Yeah. Finally. finally. Hi, Bobby. Hi, how are you? <laughs> finally. finally. Yeah, that's, but the session was really nice with you because I was enjoying it as well. Very good. Uh, my first call to Radhakshmi Ayer was 15th of June 2020. And I will have no hesitation to say it didn't take more than 20 seconds to feel welcomed uh, more than anything else. And the confirmation of the lecture was like in one phone call and everything fell into place in one phone call. It was it was really wonderful. And then I took the liberty of changing the name from Raj Lakshmi to then Raji, like she calls That's herself. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Raji is the owner of Deep Root Designs and Living Products, multidisciplinary firm that are into landscape architecture, product design. She has successfully designed over more than 250 projects and leads a team that boasts about 84 years of collective experience. 
they have provide services from india and singapore after completing her masters from spa she started uh, rad lakshmi iron associates in 1998 in mumbai uh, with a drawing board and a very 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 supportive family few projects later she moved into nagpur in 2000 opened up opportunities on a very large scale and the firm was interested of changing the face of nagpur city in the next 5 years the team was all women team Raji also made landscape architecture as a profession more visible and was awarded the Lady Entrepreneur Award in 2005 by the Vidarbha Industrial Associations. The entire family moved to Sydney in 2005, and she worked there with a highly reputed design firm by Jamie Jory called Patio Landscapes to gain valuable international exposure. Sensing that Asia would be a next growth market, the family relocated itself to Singapore. and she started her practice with rebranding her name called deep root designs in uh, india pune 2011 and singapore soon after that with the aim to provide landscape design services from both countries the business is aimed to provide sustainable and contemporary landscapes that are very deep rooted in the culture and the context of the site she is passionate about reviving the use of culturally significant plants and biophilic elements in her design she strongly very very strongly recommends her clients to integrate local art and artisans in a design process the aim of the landscape design is always to bring happiness to the user and allow for an easy i would say very very easy connect to the nature she and her team are working on exciting projects with huge mega giants like microsoft google infosys tcs to name a few Debrut was the winner of the prestigious Isola Landmark Award 2015 for their contribution to changing the face of Nagpur city by creating a vibrant urban landscape. Three years ago, Raji decided to take on another challenge by establishing a startup called Living Products. The produces landscape products that allow for better integration of landscape indoors and outdoors, and makes the connection with a slice of nature possible for everyone in the most elegant way. their first product is being patented and like she says many 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 more are in the pipeline so please watch out she has been recently awarded the women excellence uh, batukama gold award by the nra associations of singapore in jan 2020 raji it's a pleasure to have you here and would appreciate if you could take it up from here Thank thanks you. that was a really long one <laughs> really not needed i just enjoy what i do that's that's the bottom line thank you so much bobby and thank thanks so isola gujarat thanks isola rajasthan for this opportunity and after this fantastic presentation from yuko i'm just excited to share a different perspective of landscape and so here i go i'm just going to on this and get back to sharing the screen share screen and that's it so here we go so we all can see the screen now Do we see the screen, Bobby? Yep. Okay. So today, the like the topic uh, topic said beyond boundaries. I'm going to talk about different things outside landscape. Not typically. See, all our um, you know our colleagues have shown a lot of their work, and all of us are doing fantastic work. But I wanted to highlight a few other things about the landscape business. Something out of the box. So today we are going to talk about the landscape architect search of the why. Now I'll explain what does this mean basically. So I'm. Um, I'm going to hide this. Yeah. So generally, what happens when we are in college? We join architecture for whatever reasons. Then we do landscape, or you know, and uh, at that point, we are still, you know, you see, our spine is still not really erect. Uh, we're just understanding. We're understanding what it is all about. We do our first job. We join our first. You know, we do our first project. We start getting a little bit erect. Our heads are still down. We finish our first project, and then we are yes, we can do it, kind of a thing. we think we've started understanding the ropes of everything we do few years of experience and then you know shenga foot then we say like you know so we feel a lot more happy that yeah now i can think i think i know what i'm doing basically and then after some years we are a healthy sampling growing i'm not shown ourselves as a tree because as far as i'm concerned learning is a journey that never ends we keep learning and learning and learning and growing so eventually we're going to all grow into a tree but what i want to remind everybody is this was possible because this tiny sapling was rooted So, if you're rooted to your grounds, rooted to your philosophies, rooted to why you do what you do, you will definitely grow up into a tree that is going to nurture many more people and spread happiness to many more people. So, generally, how does a journey start in India? You you do five years of architecture where you're taught to think inside the box, off the box. 
think of the shape of the box and then suddenly you do landscape where you know decided you thought about anything outside the box you have to do everything you know around the box basically and after you you know kind of combine the two in seven years you feel um, you can design the spaces in and out sometimes you blend it with the architecture sometimes you decide to go on a tangent sometimes you feel the site is more important than the building and you kind of you know reflect the site so this is our general journey for a landscape architect in india what do you take on this journey you take some hard skills and you take soft skills if you notice the soft skills are even longer than the hard skills you need the hard skills definitely you need to have all the softwares you need to be able to express yourself you need to have good writing skills once you've got the project you need to know how to negotiate with your client because you need to be happy doing the project and of course documentation uh, you know your time management you need to deliver at the end but all this will happen nicely for you and for your client and for your team if you have all these soft skills that is you have a right attitude you're humble you want to learn you want to communicate you want to share you put project first you're a team player and you know you take you respect others also in your profession so these i feel these soft skills are also extremely important because they eventually turn into the values that you stand for or your business stands for so when you start your journey most of us are solopreneurs we start you know as a single person or you join a firm you take your baggage you are on your journey you take your baggage as soft skill and hard skill and you assume you're going uh, you know uh, you just started the journey so generally you don't worry about the why you know why am i doing this and all this stuff after 5 years of night marrowing and all the hard work in architecture you're really happy to do something different you go into the 2 years and then you out you're very happy to you know kind of try stuff what you've learned so you don't think about the why most of the time you're only reacting you're reacting to the client you're reacting to the site so what is this why that i've been talking about i'm massively influenced by simon senek i request everybody if you can please read the book called the start of why or you know why should you uh, it's all about the why basically and uh, he's a boss in these things there are a lot of youtube videos if you're not the reading kind as well have a look at it so what this is a golden circle so what it means that generally the what means what you do as an architect maybe you do architecture landscape design landscape products execute does interior design how you do it you'll say oh i have offices here i have so much of team i use these softwares and uh, you know this is my methodology whatever it is and why you do it is the purpose behind this why are you doing the design the particular way you're doing it why are you doing the design in a you know uh, maybe typically you have a particular style for all your projects so this why is a passion you have for your work this why is a greater purpose so for example what happens generally a client is coming to your office you have a deadline you would have printed out some huge drawings get them into the conference room either pin it up put it on the tape table and then or you do a presentation what happens you have the title of the project and then the next page is a location plan <laughs> which says the site is located on this ring road blah 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 the north is here the south is there you enter from here and you start talking about the what you're talking about the project in the what you're not even telling them how you approach the design what is the story behind the design what did you feel when you got the project how did you want to approach the project instead we go on talking about all this the client is listening but if you started with saying that oh i wanted you know i wanted to create a forest i or i want to get the birds on the side a simple line anything i want to get the butterflies if you can tell him what was that why that you did the design something happens in the client's brain he starts kind of rationalizing what you are trying to say he understands what you're trying to say he's pretty much leaning towards you because then the bomb is going to be dropped on him this is a budget and i want you to help me you know make this because if the client doesn't agree all your vision everything is going to go down the drain so you should start with your why get him on board make him understand why this project was done like that so that he is also part of your journey so that's why it's really important for you to start with the why now i have not introduced myself bobby did but before this session if somebody had asked me uh, how do you introduce yourself raji i would say i'm raji aya owner of deep rose design living products we design landscapes for exteriors and interiors from singapore pune blah 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 you know since so many years and all that kind of stuff but now if somebody asked me i introduce myself like this i'm raji aya i'm passionate about connecting people to nature and their roots for wellness and higher productivity through our vibrant experiential landscape architecture and products our teams are based around singapore and pune and we're known as deep rose design and living products if you want to be if you want to know more about me and my philosophies i do write a lot on linkedin please connect with me on linkedin so there has been a major shift in how we think in our office and this we call as design thinking in landscape architecture 
so you would wonder why why should you share all this with your team or you know why is it necessary for offices to think alike it's required because you don't want to micromanage we come from an education system where we have tuitions we are told to you know if you underline you'll get this many marks you do in points you'll get this many marks we can't run a business like that we cannot monitor everybody and every time on the business so you have to empower your team if you're going to empower your team you have to inspire them you have to share your vision with them you have to share your mission with them so that they feel the same and that's how our team a studio has a very strong identity and whatever comes out of the studio whoever designs it will add value as an end product to the client because of course we all are on this journey to come up with something nice for the client as well of course for the site and the project that's why the why is very important that's why it is necessary to share with your team and empower them as well now what my journey on the why like how did i come to this it started actually when i was about 10 years old my grandfather was in the army i come from a very middle class family and uh, i've seen very tough times so he we had a barrack kind of i mean many of you all who come from a defense family will understand we used to be given this kind of quarters uh, which had the manglo roof and uh, a stone house and the best part is we had the corner house we had a c shaped garden all around filled with six varieties of mangoes papayas we had all the fruit trees name it guava kadipatta and lemon and the favorite my favorite was the parijat of course i still remember but dog that was there and uh, some days ago when we were getting into the covid is when i was also stressing out thinking how how is the business going to run what's going to happen and i just started sketching and i realized that i was healing myself at that point and when i started sketching this is a sketch that i came up with and i realized that this sketch is what used to make me happy when i was small because this garden of mine uh, the, in our house was my uh, refueling station like my petrol station you know where i would go and refuel i used to feel most nurtured and happy in this garden any new guy used to come on the gully you would be challenged to have a hide and seek in our garden because you would always lose we knew all our does we would climb up the trees go on to the roof come down from the front broken my arm a few times but i had uh, you know sheep goat two cows i had three dogs as pets so i think i had a very blessed childhood and i realized that because i was connected to nature and that kind of a child is what made me wanting to become a landscape architect and i realized if that could give me pleasure at that age i want to be designing something that i can bring pleasure to everybody's lives so the entire shift happened money is secondary i mean money will come but the shift happened that i want to affect people with my design and that's when uh, we started thinking on biophilia and most of our designs are uh, very experiential i'll explain how we do that so that was my journey to get to the why and i'm just um, you know i've kind of evolved because i come from a family where there are no business people so i had to run a business pretty much learned on my own so i've just kind of segmented my journey into four main parts like when i started my career in bombay and where the style of landscape was more about reflecting the client or the site and after finishing uh, with sp i thought oh i would you know easily get a job i would be locked up or whatever came to bombay with my head high and realized there were no jobs available in landscape so after one month of dilly dallying here and there i took up a job in nakitex firm and within two days i was told please don't come because you think like a landscape architect and he just handed over three of his projects and said but raji will you take this on and do a job do your job as a landscape architect so that day i was worried i was scared and i was happy because i had been entrusted he trusted me with three projects i didn't know how to do them seven years of education never taught me all this and so i learned on the site i became a disciple of the contractors on the site and that's where i lost my ego to some extent and i started understanding education of seven years is not necessarily enough you always learn from other people so please respect everybody everybody teaches you something or the other and so mostly my landscape was of that style landscape i was just reflecting the site or the people at that point when i moved to nagpur uh, we did the entire city of nagpur as bobby mentioned and it was a major shift because i moved from a micro landscape to a macro landscape i moved from a detailed landscape where people enjoy detailing there was budget was not a constraint to something that i had to do very simple because a contract contractors would not understand drawings and they couldn't execute so there was a major shift in the way we thought and there were a lot of people i was handling who didn't know anything about landscape who came from the government background and they had a lot of vested interests so to uh, work with all of them move ahead still execute and execute something that is simple so they can execute it nicely and understand how people use spaces so that most of our designs should not get vandalized all this was a major learning at that part and when i moved to sydney i decided to work on the other side of the table as i joined the firm um, 
And when I joined the first firm, Clouston, uh, after doing 120 projects, I was not good enough for them to be able to you know, handle projects on my own. So I was asked to start drafting. I took it on because I wanted to understand the culture of how they work out there. But after six months, I realized that was not what I wanted to do. And I don't. I thought I was worth more than that. And I joined Jamie Dury, and he was very appreciative of all my experience. What happened in that firm is something that has shaped me today because that's how we have kind of turned out in deep roots design. I learned to um, you know, kind of design many uh, parts of the landscape. I understand we were in a firm that we wrote books uh, so Jamie Dury used to write books. He was a celebrated designer. So we were constantly talking to celebrity people. We had to be very conscious of how we dressed, how we looked, because people judged you by your book cover. We had to even understand how to present, because many a times presentation took uh, even a precedence to your matter, because once the presentation was good, it was very easy to convince them about the story behind the whole thing. So we learned about furniture design. We would do pretty much everything in the office. So I really loved that kind of a way of working. And that was something I I had a thought uh, in Nagpur as well because I was working with artists at that point and it was a vision that I would like to have a 360 degree office someday and this uh, luckily for me fortunately working with him um, laid the foundation for that so when I moved to now, uh, Singapore I rebranded ourselves uh, as a from and called ourselves as deep process and because we realized that we were very good storytellers um, I kind of think from the soul I wanted to connect many things and I wanted to connect to people so we call ourselves as deep process design and uh, then slowly of course the firm grew people working with me Aboli was working with me in Nagpur joined in Pune and we set up the firm slowly and we've now grown to where we are today uh, we have a strong corporate portfolio we work with like large MNCs and that's because of I have one feet here and one feet in India. They think of me as a bridge because I can understand what the international architects want. I can understand what the Indian uh, sensibilities are and how we should be designing for our climate, for our weather, and how we live life, basically. We're very social people. So it was very easy for me to bridge between the two, and probably that's why the corporates like to work with us as well and our professionalism in delivering drawings. So typically, we started doing a 360-degree kind of a landscape. And we learned different styles, which I will share. So the first stage was more about landscape and reflection. I've just shared a few, two projects because it was uh, tough for me to get the right quality pictures. This was for one of my first projects that I executed, <laughs> Sally Doctor. It was a very scary site. It was more than 60 degrees steep. The house was sitting on one of the flat end. I had to put my skills of all this, uh, you know, the set out drawings that we do, the levels and everything, surface drainage, everything was put to test at this point. And I really thank all the teachers who taught me in SPA. But um, so so the site was very steep. The client had paid for it. And so we had to utilize the front of the site. And this was in Kandala. Kandala, everybody knows, has, is beautiful in the rains. When the waterfalls start all over the place, and we had a waterfall coming from our site, from coming down into the pond. You could sit in with your beer or drinks. And then the water would flow out, get into a stream. I even learned to place actually the rocks and create the stream that I want with the contractors. We pull small details that we don't realize. So this was one of our first projects. We used a lot of wastages to create certain patterns. Uh, it was a reflection of the site because the site was really gorgeous. The second project was for a builder developer, and it was all about reflecting her personality. She was a typical developer who wanted, if you're spending five rupees, wants to have 50 rupees effect out of the whole thing. So the site was pretty short, but I started working on perspectives to try and give it a very long effect to the whole thing, the kind of planting, detailing in the flooring, using, of course, materials that was not expensive, but having some eye for detail to the whole thing. And then uh, when I moved to, uh, briefly, uh, when my husband moved to Helsinki, I moved as well with him for two, three months. After having worked on about 10, 12 projects in those two years, suddenly I was just sitting at home doing nothing. So I understand, and that's the reason we started the all-women office. And I, I, it was a kind of a contemplation time for me to understand whether this is what I wanted to do after studying seven years. This is what I'm cut out for. And I started doodling and drawing. My team, uh, you know, any of my friends who are there from SPA will watch for this. I used to always constantly draw even in college and this gave me a lot of solace it kind of cleared up a lot of my mind and i i understand that um, you know as landscape architects we can affect people mentally as well we are actually blessed to be in this profession and when you realize that uh, you will realize is your design doing that? You know, start asking yourselves. So these are some of the sketches I did at that point. And when I moved to Nagpur, um, I started looking at how to conserve respect. And I've just put in some projects which were value for money because that's how it became. Because I was doing a lot of projects for the government. Um, 
I didn't want to, I was just thrown into those kind of projects at that point and I have no regrets, of course. So this was our Telankari project or the Futala Talab for which we got the Ayasula Landmark Award in 2015. So this was a heritage site, Bosla time, anti-social elements were using it. It was a beautiful sunset site, but never used in that sense. And so we were asked to revamp the whole thing. In the middle of the night, we built the entire road within you know a week to 10 days because the road used to be very narrow. We had to get somebody who could actually conserve and and use the same kind of stones and do the same stonework to conserve this entire thing. It looks very simple, the design, but there was a lot of history behind how we did it. We, we were the first to use, make it inclusive rather. We had ramps going down and we, we got a lot of flakes saying that bicycles will come in, bikes will come in. But we stood our ground and it said, no, the, this education has to happen. And all this entire five years was about educating people about landscape and Nagpur, that drawings are properly done. We don't stand on site every day to get work done. We do detailed drawings and it can be done and should be done that's how it should be run the whole landscape fraternity should be considered like that that we are professionals as well and um, that was a bit of um, learning on how to handle uh, very tough government officials and still get your work done so this was another project that was a crematorium. Not many people were ready to take it on. But uh, heart in heart, I felt that if you want to live in a pretty, when you're alive, you want to be surrounded by beauty. You want to live in a nice place. But when you die, why is it that we don't even get a respectful burial, you know? So this this is how the site was in the front. You enter from the blue uh, arrow that I show. The front was, as soon as you enter, you see these burning sheds. The ambulance would come in with a dead body from the same entrance. You walked in from the same entrance. People were crying, shouting. You go in as a visitor, you know, and it was it was chaotic, basically, extremely foul smell coming in, things lying about, not at all hygienic. We took it on to kind of redesign the whole thing. We, we made a walled kind of a space wherein we had all the burials happening behind. We created a structure at 12. Actually, this was inspired by the ghats that were being developed in Ahmedabad at that point. Um, the architect uh, also came up with this idea of you know using water to clean it. So once the body cooled down, everything was cooled down. In four hours, we could actually wash. There was a proper drainage system included. We made a service entry for the ambulance to come in discreetly so it could bring the body from another entry altogether parking was given there was a huge lawn creator people could collect because many people would come with one person so and we had a proper office computer system set up so that you know which body is burning where that was again a problem we didn't even know who was burning where if you want to go and pay respects so uh, it was our humble um, journey to be able to you know help somebody even towards the fag end of his journey to create some respectful landscape this was another one that i put in because about 15 years ago, this was a Swiss factory, Bobst India. All our drawings would go to Switzerland <laughs> to be checked. And they had a four acre factory and they were just letting go of all the rainwater. So we insisted that we create a pond where we can collect all the rainwater. And that time it was very expensive for them to do it. But the CEO kind of understood where I'm coming from and we had to save water. They were one of the first factories. And now, of course, it's chock a block in this area. It's in Perangot near Pune. So we collected all the rainwater. We had small sensors put up. So when somebody crosses a sensor beam, the, you know, the fountain would change its shape. It didn't cost me much. It was 1,500 at that point. But when the CEO came and he climbed up the steps and the fountain changed, he had a nice smile on his face. And I, that's when I slowly started realizing all these projects made me realize that I'm designing to be able to connect them to their heart, connect the landscape to the heart. It was, uh, you know, the whole shift started happening slowly. I never realized till actually I drew the sketch some days ago that I was doing things uh, without realizing as well, but definitely wanted to connect people to landscape. So, um, at, uh, you know, when I started moving in um, and I moved to Australia, it was all about understanding the uh, technical part of landscape as well. Because at that point, um, I definitely wanted to learn more about detailing and um, how they use plants. And, um, and that's how I got inspired with the escaping. And that's the kind of style that I follow as well now. So this was a project for CSR in Adelaide. And we got a call from Woods Baggett saying that, uh, Raji, we have five weeks to go. And we have just $60,000 for design and build. So can you take it on? So the challenge was to create a design. That was graphically, I mean, geometrically so sharp and graphically not easy to fathom in the sense you have a space in front of you. The trick was to design something that people can't 
visualize in one shot and it slowly opens up or it's a very strong geometry so they have you know it looks like a vast expansive kind of a site i used all the rocks they were ready to throw to create an impromptu open air theater and all the planting were grassy because in adelaide you cannot water your plants in summer so they all die very similar to what you was talking about they all die in summer they get golden and then they are they come back again so there is this maturity in the society they understand plants are going to go golden they're going to die and they're going to come back so that was a very good exercise for us as well to design something very sustainable uh, this was one of our uh, one of my first actually an exhibition design um, i was asked to give a topic when we work in patio each one gives a topic for the exhibition in design x this happens in melbourne and sydney every two years so this was in melbourne at that point uh, this was in sydney sorry so uh, in sydney we were given a 10 meter by 10 meter space and the design that i came up with is an outdoor cinema because in australia all of us have a backyard it's a dream to have a backyard and we were looking at certain themes that somebody could do in a backyard of a 10 meter by 10 meter we said why not an outdoor cinema um the uh, artificial lawn was just being launched in one that causes allergies and then tick them off the list and then come up with a plan palette and they of course they wanted a space as you can see from inside the office they wanted a space that all of them can collect on a friday evening when work stops at 4:30 you go you have a babi you have your beer you can just hang about do your yoga tai chi so this has been featured because this o was again done with a new material called multi panel so we tend to use a lot of new materials in landscape as well we're constantly working with vendors trying to come up with something new so that we can introduce it for the first time in landscape this was done for the first time in landscape as well so a uh, moving from australia when i kind of moved to singapore and i realized um, when i came to singapore it was a very close knit in spite of my experience in two countries uh, it's a very close knit thing people like to work with people they are a group and it was very difficult to get into that group as well but luckily for us uh, mahindra had contacted us we were working on a resort for mahindra by then and many more projects started coming in so we decided okay why not open the office in pune and um, start taking it off from there so the vision for us when we rebranded ourselves as deep roots was every human wants to be connected to nature and whether we like it or not we real realize it or not we are wired to earth and so we decided to come up uh, with a design language altogether that was biophilic and we wanted to come up with a design language and landscape that is 4d not just 3d something that you actually experience and uh, that's what we've been doing so for others to understand what is biophilic design which is a word that's become very common now it is something that you take an exterior space an interior space and you kind of put it into biophilic design which means a design that brings nature closer to you and your memories so it helps you generate certain memories it could be memories from your childhood it could be memories of your grandfather it could be memories of your you know ancestral home anything that makes you happy and if any part of that nature has made you happy it is biophilic so it doesn't have to be life it doesn't have to be only plants it can be non living elements as well it can be any small artifact has been given to you it can be wood it can be um, you know regional art it can be an artificial moss anything that makes you you touch it and you suddenly remember something and you're happy so anything that actually connects it's a connection with nature your happiness and your memories so that's a biophilic design so what are the principles of biophilic design and it was actually coined by edward wilson but i personally feel growing up in the kind of garden i grew up i think we indians knew it long ago we somewhere lost it because we had been bombarded with western uh, landscape architects telling us how to do a design and we thought that was how we should design we kind of lost confidence in ourselves but i think we were doing it perfectly all this time when the britishers came in and got the lawn and got this colonial culture of sitting in the lawn with chai and stuff like that we started emulating it not understanding india cannot afford the lawn cannot afford the water so our uh, you know the principles that we want to bring back into design is of course these are the various elements you can speak on the screen <coughs> and it will be there in part of the video sorry video as well so by getting some kind of greenery into your space your natural light is really really important try and connect to the sunlight in the morning to recharge yourself have some kind of a water element have some color i was even talking about you know ventilation when i mean natural breeze see to it you can inspire your clients to have an open office if not all not all the time aircon maybe have some windows open in fact for microsoft at 4 o'clock in the evening when we have a wind you know we have a sea breeze coming in in bombay so we told them why don't we just 
allow a breeze to come in at say 9:30 or 4:30 that tells you start of office end of office so it says it's your break time off your computer please walk out talk to somebody go somewhere come back and then come on to your desk so very subtle ways of doing it in landscape as well yeah. some fragrances you can you know get fragrances into your conference room certain floors it doesn't have to be everything doesn't have to be something that you see from your eye you should be able to experience as well so this is one of our projects in hyderabad and in this everything is done as per biophilic we've got water bodies that we are encouraging people to walk in so we've got signages which says remove your shoes remove your chappals please come in and sit in the water please sit on the lawn please use you know the tables and chairs under the fragrant trees so we're encouraging people to use them use the spaces and luckily my client touchwood is extremely happy about this we've got a completely inclusive uh, kind of a project we've got tactiles we've no level differences that people cannot handle so it's a campus truly for everybody to use so this is how it looks every um, floor had certain terraces we worked with the interior designers to come up with a strong theme that flows from the ground to the top and the themes work from outside to inside and we've got a transition space inside as well which is not aircon so the landscape flows into the transition space and then into the interior spaces so we are doing the exterior interior and the campus for this client and every floor has like this floor was a chai theme because we were working on different themes so if it was a tea theme we had a japanese sit down pavilion we have certain herb gardens on the same floor we've got the indian kullar theme as well where we have very boisterous games for the indians um, um the for the indian theme basically then we've got a chinese garden uh, we've got different different styles based on the theme and the best part is we've worked out at activities now many a times as landscape architects we can come up with broad of concepts but the person working there should understand the concept should be able to understand oh this was a concept for this project and there should be various activities involved like we've got a wood theme wherein we've got activity zones created wherein they guys will learn how to make uh, you know um, how to use wooden blocks to do um, block printing they would use wooden work to create frames then we had a grow gardens we are even growing the herbs for a tea so we've got a japanese sit down pavilion where people will learn about a japanese art of tea making i'm talking about japanese a lot because yoko is here on the call as well um typically our ground floor is also very natural we use tend to use a lot of native plants we don't apply the trees because it, uh, birds go to sleep after 7:38 and we don't want to disturb them they are part of our um you know our en environment as well and they, we feel they are part of our journey and our space so these are some of the sky gardens we created for them so i'm just kind of um, explaining how the kokedamas are part of the activity we'll do the activities we have set out we working with the fnbs and their housekeeping and all these activities were built in into their um, the month, the yearly chart that they have so we have kokedama activities we are actually growing rice because this was part of the field theme we've got a lot of areas where they'll come and sit where we have fragrant plants which will attract the butterflies as well so that they're sitting in a place that is fragrant they're very stressed they have a fight with the boss or they don't know how to crack the code they can actually come out they've got play uh, equipments for them they can kind of collaborate network so that's how so it's a go to o2 space we call it um, in all our projects so this project we did in kenya um, this is called as purple haze now the architect had a very strong idea of um, what he wants in the courtyard he wanted it to be artistic and the four courtyards had the feng shui theme of you know the wood wind earth and fire so this is the wood and rocks courtyard wherein we're inspired by the volcanic rocks you get in kenya so if you see it is more about the sculptural elements that is uh, used here it is not so much about the plants it's the detailing that goes into the flooring the material the woodwork the stone and if you go to the next one which is a wind courtyard which is inspired by wind chimes the the sculpture takes more prominence than even the landscape at this point and the fire one doesn't even have a single plant in it so what are, this is all this is biophilic because bonfires in africa is part of the culture so we wanted to come up and of course the kind of lighting that we've done out here and these are again volcanic rock crushed elements that we've used so we are connecting them to their roots also in this way so it doesn't have to be plants all the time certain other projects that we're doing for a school wherein we're using a plaza with different languages so we have at the moment because it's in sketch up we could put only in english but we have english marathi sanskrit hindi all the languages embedded into the flooring itself so that children can actually learn and play 
So this is for a school that we're doing. Um, and again, another play area that we're doing, which is about play and landscape, where we're creating ch child friendly, wherein we've got a little bit of danger elements also. We've got the jewelers or we've got the rope bridges because we want the children to grow up bold. We don't want them to be, you know, uh, cajoled all the time. So this kind of a skate park is something is planned in such a way that we can access, the outsiders can access on a weekend so we can generate revenue. And all of us, all these years will realize if our landscape gen doesn't generate revenue, the client is not going to take care of it. And that's why probably many of us struggle to share some of the good executed pictures of our projects compared to other international architects because rarely they are taken care of well after that. Clients don't have money or they kind of lose interest in it or whatever reason. This is our first brownfield project, which has been featured extensively and we've got very, very good reviews for it. It's called Blue Ridge in Pune in Hinjewari. This was a project that we were asked to revamp. They didn't have as-built drawings. We didn't know what was happening below the surfaces. So we got some drone surveys done. And from the drone survey, we had to make presentations to the client and get the design approved. So I really must thank my team. We did a fantastic job on Photoshop and SketchUp. And then from the sketch provided, we had to execute the project. And we had to stand on site and do this. Though uh, we pride ourselves in doing excellent drawings, but because we really didn't know what was below, none of them had any aspel drawings. We were pretty much working on site in certain very tight constraints. So this was executed and handed over about a year ago. Um, the entire terrace was, I'll just explain, this was how it was and it was given to us and what we transformed into. So the client has now got a canteen uh, cafeteria on the top. This entire uh, terrace is there. They've got about 20,000 people in this project and uh, on the building rather. And we had to create a lot of spaces. So instead of going down where there was no place on the ground, everything happens on the terrace. So this was one of the major transformations we did. Similarly, same kind of picture, what happened there and what we had to do, working with extremely tight budgets again. So we had to work with plants that will do this talking for us. So kind of plants and then worked on, on the surfaces, the drainage and uh, basic things so that you know we were working on a budget and still we are able to give them something really nice that they can look out for and be happy about. Other projects that we did for TCS, one of the largest campus we did was on 75 acres um, some years ago in 2017, 2018. And this project, um, they because of the budgets with TCS, I guess many of you know who will be working with TCS, we, we decided to go with a mass planting kind of a strategy. So we had large areas of a single species and spe we tried to see to it that most of the species would attract the butterflies, the dragonflies and the bees as well on the site. So the entire thing was done like this and TCS uh, wanted the, you know, they wanted these palms. Generally, I would never use such palms which are not native, but the client insisted that they wanted it because we're very inspired by the Hyderabad airport that was done at that point. Uh, we also had a lot of local native plants. We had Kalamka trees that would be used for dyeing and you know which we can use um, which is the use in the dyeing industry as one of a signature plant um, GE was also executed on a war footing as I've, I've put only certain projects that had a story to tell like this project we had to design and build in nine months it was a 60 acre site and we had to work with contractors to design and build this. The concept was uh, the, uh, Narendra Modi was supposed to open this project and we were not given much of time. So we told the clients, once we show you the concept, please don't expect us to do DD, CD, GFC kind of stage. We will be building as the site asked for. So we actually sat with the contractor. He would come to the office. Oh, I, I'm going to plan. I'm planning this side of the site. Can you give me the drawings? I'm planning that side of the site. And that's how we built it. And um, we, the whole site at Black Cotton Soil, we had to get horticulturists on board, um, condition the soil and reuse it so that we don't, um, uh, you know, we don't spend money on this. Just um, just a second, please. I'll have to just, uh, somebody at the door, I'm just trying to, just one second. And there's no one to take the, just a minute.
that. So this was executed in Handover, and uh, Prime Minister Modi came to open it at that point. And uh, this is GE's largest ever establishment outside US. This was one of our projects called Poise Garden in Chennai. Artis there should know about it. Very close to Jaya Lalita's house. I put this project because you don't see a single service in the project. The challenge on this project was it was a high end, and we didn't want to kind of show any uh, kind of services on this project. So everything is kind of hidden in the planter here, and we created dummy planters so that all the services can go. And we had GRC screens to hide them, and this whole project was executed that way. Another project of ours, which was the first uh, podium project that we did in BKC in Bombay behind the Trident Hotel, all three of them were done by us. Slightly luxury, high-end projects where you have Ashwarya Rai and all these guys buying houses and some big shots staying out here. So for us, it was a huge learning because uh, working out the surface drainage, subsurface drainage, working out all the sleeves that is needed, and coming up with still a design in six hundred of soil. So the soil was very less, but we had to choose the planting, which are broad leaves, so that they give you a massive built look, so that they look as if they've been there for a long time and looks big and nice. So that was one of the challenges. You do see that there are certain planters that was allowed structurally where we could put trees. Otherwise, everything is on a 600 centimeter soil. I personally feel nature is not a place you visit; it is home. And this is said by Gary Sandler, but I kind of resonate this as well. So living products was started because we realized that when we did interior landscape for Infosys, we realized there was nothing available in the market other than green walls and potted plants. And if we want to connect nature, we want to connect people to nature. We should be able to do it in six inches of soil. And I need only six inches of space to be able to, you know, give uh, Harita. This we call this as Harita, and we can give you three plants in six inches. And that was how the idea was born. So we wanted to bring nature into everybody's life, and but we wanted to do it in style. We have a lot of potted systems and everything, but we want to do a, a very classy design. Which is patented because of the system, the way it works, where it interlocks into one another, and it's completely drip ready. And there is no system in the world that is drip ready, and that's the reason uh, we got a patent on this as well. So it is, uh, we can do any colors, any finish, and this is how it looks. The panels open, you can access the plants, you can use it as cut flowers, and the kind of finishes that we give you is, you know, you can co-create with us whatever finish you want, wooden finish, silver finish, anything you want, we can do. So this is how it looks in my office. We've got <laughs> all the walls are covered with Harita, and within 30 minutes, you can actually get an entire wall done. You are able to get the wind in. You are able to have a view. We are not blocking things off. And in this case, we're using invis strings. It's a kind of a style of doing the fencing where you use SS strings. And this allows wind to come in, but it doesn't allow the birds to come in. And when somebody looks at your balcony, you see like a floating green. So this is something that we are working on for big facades. And you know, for our IT clients, we're doing it on their terraces. And we've got chandeliers created for one of our projects wherein the greens are going to be hanging from the top using Harita. We can create big installations like this. This is uh, somebody asked us to design for a park in Hong Kong, um, whether we can do an instant kind of a tree like this, which has plants as well as lights. And we can even do it down to up. So we can create use, uh, we call them the reeds. And we're massively influenced by the typhus uh, that we see in nature. So it's completely pest proof. You cannot have mosquitoes in them. They don't leak. So they're not going to create any problems for you. They they come in smallest of spaces. They're so very easy to you know have a slice of green, so to say. They're all recyclable, ethically packed as well. And they last for a long time. So what happened? I mean, what have kind of uh, kind of to summarize the whole thing through my journey in these three countries or three continents, so to say, what I've learned is, of course, to work on different styles of landscape project. But more than that, what I've learned is to how to build a very strong landscape practice, how to have a contract that is foolproof, how to have indemnity insurances. And I constant I mean, I constantly remind any of my friends who are discussing or who are happy to share and discuss is that please have a good indemnity insurance for all your projects and have proper financial planning so that, you know, we save at least three to four months of salaries for our team every time we do and uh, invoicing on time planning the invoicing resource management project scheduling skill upgradation because the team is always you know we are always uh, exposing them to new skills and they're sent for say sketch up skills or um, now at the moment in my office because of covid and everything all of us are doing branding and marketing ourselves so we learn we check out certain youtubes or we check out um, i'm attending certain sessions i share it with them we have somebody to come and talk about behavioral styles and how how are our clients behaving what category do 
they fall in how do we handle the clients so they're all learning about soft skills and you know how to review and we do a lot of staff reviews as well so that all of us can grow and mentor each other and all this has culminated into a kind of a value system that we follow in our office and we always put project first so we are team players typically and we tend to have a 360 approach to design all this has also created the why for deep pros this is what deep pros actually stands for now and that's how we design so i've said what how you know why we design those things basically is because of the value systems we have and you know what we want to do we want to connect people to nature I and mean, how we did it we of course realized that we built on our skills we gathered experience doing variety of projects and we were able to provide the what so what we offer as a service is we are able to give you a lot of art and activities in the landscape which is culture driven we are able to understand smart designs like one of our clients it giants that we're doing in hyderabad the entire thing like uh, mahendra ji also mentioned we're working on a bms irrigation system wherein it is evapotranspiration sensors actually we're not doing the soil moisture sensors we've done a few testing and it doesn't work so we are working on the et kind of sensors we've got qr codes there is an entire layer a digital layer on the landscape in fact there will be apps all our landscapes will kind of pop up when somebody is walking onto the campus they'll know oh this is the brahma kumbh it blooms only once and blooms in the night or blooms once in maybe two years so there are a lot of this trivia that is then thrown up at them we have a lot of different styles of gardens so there is history about them and different what are the new things that we're going to do what are the activities in our garden spaces in the entire campus so all all these things um, as landscape architects we have suggested to them we have built a vision for the company we've done actually a book for them that they will share with their customers who come to the campus we are working with them to create this digital layer so that uh, you know when somebody comes and it's like you know they are invited from and they come to know the guests will come to know or the team in the it campus comes to know that the guest has arrived from the airport from there the journey starts and when the guest enters into the campus all the landscape elements is also going to pop up into his app that is being created so it's a different digital overlay altogether that we're working on with these clients so as landscape architects we're doing smart designs as well and we design holistically that is we do exterior interior we also design customized products for them so for us it's always a project first and that is uh, the base of our design thinking i would want to leave you all saying that look we've been given the freedom let's use our freedom to bring nature into our lives and as landscape architects we are actually blessed to be able to affect somebody because um you know like shahir would always say whatever you draw on paper is going to be drawn on mother earth so please be conscious about it use your freedom with responsibility and try to do you know try to kind of affect people because what you're doing you're very blessed to be in a profession where you can actually help people maybe your landscape can help with you know a lot of mental problems that people are having we can also help them in a physical and a mental way so that by giving pure air or purifying as well as uh, connecting them to their roots to their culture and uh, making them realize what gives them happiness so i think we are in that position to be able to do this and we should use the freedom very responsibly and happy independence day to everybody today thank you thank you raji thank you raji it was brilliant i think it was very very brilliant. sorry for a little disturbance in between <laughs> No, no, that's perfectly all right. That's perfectly all right. I thought landscape is all about that. You have to accept everything that comes along the way. So <laughs> yes. that's not that. So I actually, I, I personally wanted to show projects that not necessarily are the best of our projects, but the you know every project teaches you. And many a times, many a times, we're just sharing true. projects that are the best. It shouldn't be like that. We should take pride in every project we do because every project shapes us, and every project we learn something basically. So very well, that's a true. Every project is a good learning, and like you said rightly, when you started the lecture, saying the ego has to be put on the side yes. to ensure that you learn as much and as you can, as you can soak in as much as you can. True. Very true. Yeah. Uh, can we have the other speakers, please, also? And I would request all of you all to have question answers for all of them. Mahendra Singh ji is he here? Okay. Raji, I think would require a little bit of rest, so I'll start with the first <laughs> question of mine with uh, Yuko. Yes. Ah, uh, I would. Uh, I mean, we all were blessed with looking at the gardens. 
done by Pete Rudolf. I would re really say, how was your experience working with him? Because we would all love to know that. Yes. Um, right. Uh, every garden designer uh, had a different style. And uh, at the beginning, it's okay. My experience working for, working in the Chelsea Flower Show for the first time is I am a bit, bit nervous and under pressure to prove myself I'm good enough. And, uh, I know the plant and I can I can do it. But there are many gardeners in my team who want to be the number one girl or leading leading gardener. So it's kind of competition between the between the team. And if we win the gold and make the designer happy, then we can gather at the Chelsea Flower Show again in the next year. But if we got a bronze or silver. Uh, or we couldn't sort of make the garden as the designer imagined in in her head, and the designer is not really not really happy. Then we have no next time. So for the first time, Jersey Flower Show, it needs to learn what she or he wants to create in the garden and sort of copy his style quickly. And uh, it's not about expressing myself. I have to lead one designer's style, you know, the mind and the mind and the style, and trying to sort of interpret and make the make the garden until he say, "Okay, I'm happy with it, what you've done." And for the next year, if I try. The different garden designer with a different style or approach to his work, and then sort of I am looking through his you know, past work on the magazines or many internet Google searching and email and put my impression in my head and go onto the site and um, doing and um, it. In communicating with him until he became a um, he became a good or uh, happy with what you know, what he's trying to do. And obviously, two examples: Joe Thompson and James Carson, completely different designer, and it's it's almost different planting style, learning from the scratch. For the Joe Thompson, is it's, uh, I learned a lot from her use of color and the flower color and the texture and the bring very sort of harmonious color in front of the audience and merging to uh, naturalistic styles of leafy green planting at the background but making sort of detailed style. On the other hand, the famous person wants to make a recreation of the real site in somewhere else in Mediterranean Island. So the planting is a precise copy of the one natural site on the Mediterranean place. It looks like a natural habitat. Um, so it's an, another different challenge. And, uh, the the plants are used plants are completely completely <coughs> different, and the Joe Thompson is using many popular garden garden plants like a peony, iris, rose, all sort of nice variety and the already known thing. But the James Bond's work I work with, uh, along with the herbs. Uh, but he sort of involved in many sort of weed or something you wouldn't find in the garden center or garden shop or you don't you have no idea what okay. so but and the, the, yeah. the place he wants to create is the place i've never been to so i learning 
every different set of designer, it always gives me a challenge and a new style and a new product. So, so you yeah. actually work, so you actually try to read all the people whom you work with mm -hmm. and then take it up from there and go and study their styles and then take it up from there. Yeah. Very no good. one is saying. Uh, no one is saying. Sure. Raji, I have a question for you. Uh, we could see a lot of in, uh, customization in your projects. Okay, very high degree of customization. And of course, in that you said you, you actually introduced rice farming. Now, would you actually give them a maintenance manual as to how they have to do it? Or we do. You know, because, because it might be very cumbersome for them. So we do, actually. We do a maintenance regime and we learned it the hard way. When we did the interior landscape for Infosys, we realized that they pretty much were killing everything within the one month of after we had executed. So okay. we talked to the clients and like I said, you know, once you, um, just a minute. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we talked to the clients and we explained to them, guys, let us do the maintenance also. Even if you're paying us a little bit more for that, there is value in the project because True. of that. So we kind of convinced them. That's why it's really important for you to know what you want to, you know, how you want the project to end up. Mm -hmm. And to be able to convince, so when you have the passion, the client agrees. He's ready to do that, it. That's very true. That's very true. Yeah. That was true. Mahindra Singh, you have a question. Uh, right. when, you, when, you, when you said the question of smart irrigation system, and today we looked at the presentation of Yuko and we looked at Raji, where they are really going back to the roots of saying, how should we look at true naturalistic planting? Now, obviously, that will bring down the uh, water requirement, which is one part. But let's say if you did smart irrigation systems, what you were mentioning, is there a thumb rule how you calculate saying that that what is the percentage of uh, either running cost or the quantity of water which you save as compared to a conventional system? Hmm. Will you please repeat it? Uh, see, for example, what happens is when you when you have a conventional system of an irrigation system as compared right. to the smart system. Hai. So, if right. smart system, कोई अगर आपको बोलता है कि भाई चलो मेरे को smart system चाहिए, तो okay. वो आपको ये पूछेगा एक तो होगा उसका cost जो हम नहीं discuss कर रहे हैं. But as very sensitive people towards the profession which we are, in terms of कोई पूछे कि पानी का requirement कितना बचेगा, या running cost कितना बचेगा, तो उसका कोई ऐसा thumb rule calculation है. See, as landscape architect, we don't need to get into nitty gritties of every drop, but we should know कि भाई हाँ इसमें 30% of पानी save होगा या 40% save होगा, running cost इतना होगा, so that kind of a thing. Actually, जो conventional जो system था, जो कि यानी flood irrigation करते थे, तो flood irrigation से जब हम यानी timer based automation पे आए, तो उसमें basically यानी 40 to 50% water saving था उसमें. अभी टाइमर बेस्ड ऑटोमेशन से जब स्मार्ट इरिगेशन पे आते हैं तो उसमें 15 टू 20 परसेंट वाटर सेविंग एडिशनल रहता है क्योंकि इसमें है कि हम यानी ह्यूमिडिटी को भी यानी कंसीडर करते हैं सोइल मॉइस्चर को भी कंसीडर करते हैं तो ये सब कंसीडर करने पे 15 टू 20 परसेंट वाटर सेविंग और होता है इसमें तो 15 टू 20 परसेंट इज व्हाट यू आर सेइंग राइट ओके राजी आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम हिमांशु फॉर यू ही सेज you have worked on so many projects across the globe. Uh, how is it different? Can you elaborate? How have you looked at in different regions, looking at different projects, considering that you're working such cross countries? Um, one thing is like when you're working in India, of course, um, you have to understand the sensibilities of the people. Like I keep saying again and again, I always talk to all the architects. Classic example, um, if I may give, is when we're working with Binoy London for TCG, a project in uh, Gurgaon. The kind of design that they had come up with um, for the whole building, it was a very architectural centric design. In fact, they had put the buildings in such a way that there was hardly any space for landscaping around because they thought, like it happens in London, things can happen on the top, on the roof. And they didn't realize that there would be something called MOEF. You're going to need your 20% green on virgin ground. You're going to need all the, you know, mandatory fire, uh, fire <laughs> which all of us struggle with, an 8-meter fire now, so it's 9 meters uh, that we have to leave. No, technically, all these things. So when you work mm -hmm. in Australia, it was very professional in the sense you present to your client first. He's mm -hmm. never in the picture after that. In the sense, you don't go about showing every stage of drawing to them. They kind of trust you. They know that you're going to deliver everything on time. And you will have proper contracts with contractors as well, which we kind of don't do. So we used to have proper contracts that we would sign with the contractor so that he will execute exactly the way we had designed. 
and we would make if the contractor was okay. through the client we would see to it that the client got the contractor to sign those things and in india typically what happens we've started adding in a contract that if you don't use the contractors we have vetted and we have suggested we will not be responsible for the outcome you can't hold it against us that this didn't turn out this way didn't turn out that way or stuff like that so i guess we need to kind of understand how the the countries work the professionalism of the people the whole system and then adapt yourself accordingly that is sure. as for the contractual part of it design of course you know it, you you will react you will you will understand what is needed on the site and what is needed basically and how we use spaces like in india you we uh, in india typically for lunch or dinner we all sit together and eat we bring a lunch along we want to sit and chat that is our you know uh, fun time or collaborative time but if you see in australia or singapore they will eat alone they will just walk go sit in one place eat in a corner come back that is your me time they will put it in their ears and they in their own world they don't network we are not like that we love to sit together so we had to create a lot of these collaborative spaces in the landscape as well so that many sure. times in india over drinks you make meetings you come up with ideas which was very new concept for them because everything is very structured so probably sure. you have to adapt based on yeah you have to kind of look at the end user and then adapt your designs accordingly to kind of plug in what you think is apt for their working Correct. styles and refreshing 